Hi, Ervant. So, Hi. so wonderful to see you again. Thank you for joining me on this conversation of mindful leaders inherited legacies. Uh, you are all the way at Silicon Valley, am I correct right now? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've always heard about you. Uh, I've always known something about you, but um, I really got to appreciate your soul when we sat down together uh, and had a very deep conversation about four or five years ago. Uh, so before we get into the deeper conversations, I just for people who don't know who you are um, or your professional journey, I'd like to point out that you are from Aleppo. You graduated um, in Aleppo University, uh, and then you moved on your own, worked your way to do your master's in California at USC, all again in the area of engineering and high tech. And then you, if I'm correct, you also then moved to Montreal where you did your PhD. Yes. I'm giving a very brief because there's so many things that happened in between all those years of your, of your education. But the, to point out that immediately after you got your doctoral degree in Montreal, you flew all the way to Princeton and you actually managed um, start, a, I think it was more or less um, uh, what you call Bell Labs or specific labs that you did for yes. AT&T Bell. AT yeah, it was the AT&T Research Laboratory called Bell Labs. That's right. That's right. Then you managed several startups, one of which was actually acquired by Synopsys. And since then, you've actually been the chief architect and you've been a fellow at Synopsys International. And another hat is that you've actually um, been president of Synopsys Armenia. So I'm not even describing, I'm not even skimming through the many things you've done in between, which we'll get a chance to talk about. I'm curious to know with this rich leadership experience or journey that you've had, what have been your key successes in leadership? What, what have been the ingredients for your leadership success? Yeah, uh, leadership for me, it's not just a personal uh, activity. Leadership is a, is a group activity. So I think my, 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 if I had any success in, in, in different steps of my life, was in including uh, a team around me, including a group of, of peers with me moving forward. From, from early age, from my student activities, uh, during my uh, professional activities, I've always liked to, to work with teams, uh, to be an example for the team, uh, collaborate, delegate, and then pull back sometimes uh, to, to allow them to move forward. So, so, so sharing with a team, communicating, over communicating as needed is important. But to do that, you need to have a passion. You need to have a passion for a particular topic, for a particular outcome, and, and uh, ensure that that, that passion is, is, is passed on. And it, it's not your own passion only, right? If it's your own passion, it remains with you only. So sharing that passion, communicating it, and taking a team with you in a journey, I think is, 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 is a very good thing to do. And I, I appreciate that a lot. You know, but leading organizations, Yervant, um, or any kinds of project for that matter, uh, you, you are, you're part of a team, as you say, and uh, you're surrounded by a variety of people, different backgrounds, different talents, different stories. You know, um, you're bound to have issues. You're bound to have problems. And you're bound to witness uh, or notice cases of workplace injustices, for instance, or unfairness. Let's take the example of injustice. What is your approach to managing issues like unfairness or injustice? My approach has typically been to, to negotiate it up, to be able to find a, a good solution, a win-win solution, a win-win-win solution, to match uh, everybody's needs as much as possible. I like that, in fact, even from my childhood, when uh, I used to do multidimensional puzzles, when I used to get words from my teacher to make sentences. I would create one sentence which had the five words in it instead of doing individual sentences. When I grew up finding, finding solution that matches several conditions, uh, building a formula with multiple parameters and satisfying them is, is, is a nice thing I found. So also there, uh, when I had difficulties with, 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 my, with my team members and so on, finding a good solution to match all of them by peaceful ways through uh, soft uh, diplomacy, if you want to call it. I think is a way because you always can find a good solution 
without fighting, without uh, creating adversary situations, without being aggressive, uh, and you can reach your outcome. So I learned that from my childhood that finding a good solution can be done in, in peaceful, nice, negotiating ways. Um, one of my difficulties, for instance, was in the industry when I started a standardization group. Uh, I mean, the chip design, as you know, uh, when the chips were becoming complex and complex, and then you couldn't do one chip by yourself anymore as a team. You had to bring pieces from different places, put them together. For these pieces to interface with each other, you need to standardize. You need to find ways to, to get one piece from this company, one piece from that company, and, and create your own chip. For that, I, standard, I started the standardization team. But that standardization team had 70 different companies participating in it. So you had to find a single standard that satisfies 70 companies to, to make them work. And, and this is this business. So they have to be successful in each one of them. So you have to deal with people and with companies at the same time. By the time I finished it, it was a great experience for me. And the award, what, the award that I got as a result was for not for achieving the standard, but for diplomacy. <laughs> because they thought that negotiating it out with, with a single solution was a good thing. So again, back to, to, to the way of doing things. I think in a nice, simple, uh, soft way, you can find a good solution for, for any problem. Yeah, uh, I can agree and disagree with that. And for instance, if you, you know, uh, negotiating or, or having a diplomatic way may not necessarily um, address your also frustrations, right? Because you may be addressing or you're, you're an engineer, so you always try to find, you know, solutions to problems. And that's, that's, that's a very, but also there's, you know, we, we, we tend to focus, and I speak for myself as well, we tend to focus as managers, as professionals, and even as academics, we spend time on focusing on what to do the techniques you know for instance um, what techniques to, to to do or what theories to develop or to apply what models to implement yes. just to make sure that we have an effective and efficient organization but we rarely think of who to be or who we want to be and the reason why I'm saying this and I'm, I personally was inspired by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur and he expands on this idea that and says we become increasingly moral and ethical when understanding who we are based on the relations we have with others. So we're not separate beings. We don't you know, construct things on our own. Everything is not as objective because, but it's much more of a relational. And that relational implies that we should be mindful. So my question to you now is adding this, this idea, keeping this in mind, what for you is mindfulness? This, you know, especially how, how does a leader become mindful and what does that mean for you, Yervant? Yeah, but, uh, mindfulness is extremely important. I, 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 fully, I fully agree with you. Um, you need to be caring about your people at the same time and about the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and they come hand in hand with each other. So on one hand, you're, you're trying to find a solution to the problem, but at the same time, you need to, to be able to be mindful with them, to, to respect their ideas, to respect their opinions, and move them towards a single solution. So I think leadership is, is, is moving these this, this multiple factors together towards one point uh, without creating issues, without creating challenges. Of course, wh whenever you have challenges, you have to solve them, but doing it in a, in a mindful way, in a coherent way, is, is an important factor. Good, okay, okay, understood. Uh, I'm going to turn back to you uh, as a person. You're you're a rather hardworking individual. I say this because knowing your life story, um, more or less, obviously, you never wasted any time um, with anything. You know, uh, children today, for instance, they look forward to spending their free time gaming on uh, their laptops, their computers, their phones. But as a child, you would spend time learning musical instruments, languages, reading, leading committees, doing theater. I mean, it was just f full. And your parents seemed to be rather disciplined when it came to your education, yours and your sisters, obviously, Huri and Maida. Your father, Api, I think told you once, and if I remember this story correctly, and if not, please correct me, um, he would say that your education is your passport. You can lose you know, money, land, family, but your education will always be a part of you. Do you, do, did your parents really impose, impose that idea? Why did they insist that you needed to be um, the best at 
whatever you did. Yeah, exactly what you said. I think our, our survival as a nation, I'll take it larger for a second, is, is based on what we can carry with us, right? Uh, genocide, other events in life, migration. We all change cities, countries many times, right? What you carry with you is, is your knowledge. Uh, and that knowledge is important to be prepared well, to be prepared early on during your formation years and go with you stage by stage throughout. And yes, education is what you carry with you. So, so that, that was truly the, what I got from my parents, not only in statements, but in action, what their parents did as well. My, my grandfather survived genocide because of his education. Um, he was able to escape uh, Trabizon, um, not to escape at that time, to go to Beirut to do his master's degree after he got his uh, bachelor's from Anatolia College because of, 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 of his education. Mm -hmm. um, we thought that education is something that can be carried with you. Yes, I was born in Aleppo, I moved to Canada, now I'm in, the, in Silicon Valley. And what, what I carry with me is, is what I learned. All, all the features and all the knowledge that, that you have with you. Um, what we also learned that education is not something that you only acquire, but, but you also give to others. So if I look at my, my parents' journey, also mine, was, was in education, not only obtaining education, but rather giving the opportunity for others to be educated as well with you. Again, part of this team building, part of this community building and, and moving forward. So, so yes, we, we need to do that. I think that's, that's a message, not for me as individual, but for us at large as a nation to, to build our education properly, to be professionals and then help others when, when you are ready. Well, yeah, I'm gonna come back to the, that point about your family um, and what you've done also, uh, namely with AVC, but your earliest memory uh, of the genocide comes from your parents um, comes from a teacher at Haigazian uh, Aleppo's uh, elementary school, Vahe Jamakordzian. He, mm -hmm. he would, and the reason why I mentioned this is because this really, um, how do I put it? It didn't shock me. It was a pleasant surprise to hear that uh, at the age of 10 or 11, when you're in grade four and grade five, you know, here's this teacher, also well known in the community in Syria. Um, here's this teacher who would read to you at such a young age, you and your, your colleagues, Zartunk. You know, Malchas' awakening, that's a heavy and emotional novel to read, you know, especially to acquire that. Um, so obviously you, you absorbed all this, uh, like many of your friends. How, for you, have these genocide stories, you think, have shaped you? Uh, immensely. Immensely, because that was, for me, a new experience when I started hearing. Uh, at home, we did not talk too much about, about genocide. Uh, the fact that um, my parents always did not de-emphasize the negativity, emphasize the positivity. We always talked about uh, the, the super things that our nation did throughout, throughout history, in, in culture, in, in, in every single aspect. Of course, we spoke about genocide as well, but it was not as, as emphasized as I heard it in my, in my classroom. Uh, the fact that my, my family did not, um, did not go directly to genocide. My, my grandparents were in Aleppo for, for many generations. Your, my mother's, your mother's, uh, your maternal grandparents you're talking about now. Correct. Yes. Sons. Sons. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I, I always knew about my, my father's cousin, Asho Zorian, the painter who, who uh, survived the genocide with, with, with lots of challenges. Uh, plus my, my teacher's stories, uh, made me made me uh, much more appreciative of our survival as a nation, our tribe as a nation, and that became part of what I do today. In every step of my my life, after that, I feel that the genocide has a major impact, and in every step, we try to, while remembering it, but we don't dedicate ourselves to remembering only what we should do in order for that not to repeat again. Uh, how to grow how to be stronger uh, economically, uh, physically, uh, diplomatically, and militarily, in order for that not to repeat itself. Very good. Thank you. I'm, uh, you, you briefly spoke about Yervan Zorian Sr. 
your grandfather, your grandfather, the one that was educated and how you, how you and your family actually felt also there's an influence on education. I want to be able to go back to his story because it's a, it's a very interesting one. Um, your great grandfather, so Yervant Zorian Sr.'s father uh, was killed during the Hamidian genocide in the late 1800s. And your yes. grandfather, when he was younger, uh, obviously has, he just lost his father, was sent to, like you mentioned earlier, um, Anatolia College, right? Uh, and I find this very interesting. Your grandfather's older brother says, okay, you're out of Anatolia College now. We're gonna send you to Beirut to continue your education there. And lo and behold, while he's studying in Beirut, all of his family, except for his nephew that you mentioned earlier, the painter, Ashod, um, all of his family, 99% of Drabzond was completely massacred, murdered. And so he's the only one left. Uh, and I mean, I don't know, you can call that luck, you can call that divine intervention, I don't know how it is, but that's, that's a powerful story. You know, you, you yeah. as, a, as a person, you realize your entire family has perished and you know, by luck, because my older grand, my older brother encouraged me to go study, here I am surviving this, this situation. Your, you mentioned also about your, your, mother's grand, your mother's parents, right? The Minasians, who also during the genocide took in and led a lot of the different uh, committees to help the migrants, uh, the Armenian orphans coming in. And I remember also you told a story, which was also very nice, but also very emotional that you and your sisters would actually be sat down at home and many of the genocide survivors older at that time would actually come and tell their survival stories. So I, here I am, Yervan Zorian, you, right? I, I have this, this image that even if my parents didn't really specifically describe the genocide to me, I have all these stories, you know, my teacher from Zartung, from, you know, uh, the, the survivors who would come and visit me. Do you recall what you felt when you heard these stories? And because you were little, and now looking back at those at that time, what do you feel about those stories today? What has been the impact of your memory of the genocide on you? Yeah. Uh, my memory has been uh, definitely strongly impacted. Strongly impacted on one side, of course, frustration, but the other side is what to do next. Uh, frustration for what we went through. Unfortunately, we were not able to, to, to get, um, to maintain our land, to maintain. And I had the chance, I had the chance two years ago to go back to Trabizon, to visit the, the, the Armenian quarter there, to go to Armenian cathedral, the monastery on, on top of the hill. The, the attachment that you, 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 you feel from where your, your grandparents, their parents, and their parents have lived uh, in, in these places is something totally different. Yes, we were deprived from that. But deprived from that, we, we also are still successful. We also have thrived. We also are able to, to bring in the next generations to, to, to maintain our, our, our national feelings. And most importantly, to have an Armenia, to have an Armenia that stands on its foot, that is supposed to, to be very strong, in terms of uh, economic success, in terms of uh, its ability to, to, to give chance to the, to the following generations. My feeling is that we are just one circle in a chain, hmm? one unit in a, in a continuous chain. And our duty, my duty, my, our generation's duty is to be able to continue that chain, to be able to, to, to give the continuity for our, our nation. Otherwise, any, any unit of it hmm, that breaks will we'll not be able to, to provide that continuity to our nation. So that's why I think it's our duty for every generation to maintain that field, to maintain the activity, to be proactive in continuing that. Right, and I believe also maybe you can expand on this, but uh, your frustration also led for you to think about what is needed in the diaspora and what is needed in Armenia. And for the diaspora, you know, the idea was we need to maintain our identity, hence, the reason, one of the reasons why you developed or you founded and you managed um, uh, the Armenian Virtual College that has currently more than 14,000 members. 
And you're also working towards something what you just mentioned on touching upon was the viable knowledge base um, based economy and technology in Armenia. So if, if I take all this, you're, 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 you're becoming productive with your fr frustration, seeing what needs to be done to move forward. But tell me how with all of this and all that's happened, especially in 2020 with the Artsakh nagorno karabakh war, how do you make sense of it all now? Um, the war, of course, is, is unfortunate. Unfortunate in the sense that we lost lives, first of all, we lost land, huh? but the war should be a lesson for us. The war should be a lesson for us to become stronger, to see what we have missed and to build back our strengths, huh? to build back the nation that we have, we have to come up with, right? The war should not be something that will divide us. The war should not be something to go back and, and punish each other for it and find who has, there are many mistakes, many mistakes in Armenia, many mistakes in diaspora for not giving us enough chances with different countries. So, so if we, you want to list the mistakes, but we're not here to punish them. We're here to learn from it and move forward. That's why the day after we need to start planning forward. We need to look at the scenarios to come, and, and be prepared for every single scenario that will, will, will be in front of us. And to do that as a, as a total nation, this is not only the duty of Armenia and Armenians who live on the Armenian land. The global Armenian nation, all of us, who were so excited uh, during the war to help Armenia. To unite. To, keep, to unite, to, to maintain, to, to help in, in any possible way. Now we have to be even more excited to rebuild Armenia, much more proactive, much more energetic. This, this feeling of disappointment, of course it's there, but that feeling of disappointment has to be continued with this much stronger feeling to contribute back, to put your nation back on its foot. And that's a duty for every army around the world. Yervan, I have nothing more to ask you. You're a beautiful person. I just wanna thank you for having taken the time to share your personal thoughts and reflections with me. Thank you, Yervan. My pleasure. Thank you.